To do MCMC simulation by JAX for the simple linear regression model, we're going to look at the model stream first. And I will just also pause here to give you the time, maybe also link to what you know already, especially um, last chapter we talked about the hierarchical modeling using the normal model in general. And then, of course, how to look through all of the observations. Does this make sense to you? And one more thing I would mention is while well, denorm in the JAG script takes mean and precision. Okay, so that's why you see those uh, dealing with different values over here. Okay, so you just chat with your neighbor really quick to convince yourself that the two loops make sense, oh, only one, sorry, one, the loop makes sense to you, and then also the ways that we're giving the prior is consistent to what we have been talking about so far. Yeah. Um, all right, any questions about the way that we write the models? stage or comments no questions i guess overall it's straightforward it's probably even simpler than uh, the, the hierarchical model script that we did before because that time i think we had to not nested but multiple loops and um yeah so the only thing i would highlight here is uh, about those precision okay so inverse sigma square over here and this later we're going to pass over this position instead of the uh, standard deviation. Okay. A and B will be the one one that we can do. Okay. All right, so the next page, as you um, are now familiar with, we're going to pass the data and the hyperparameter values to JAX. So Y will be the log expenditure. Okay. X will be the log income. So those are saved in the data set that I shared. And again, it's the length of the observation, which will be the number of observations. So you're going to pass y, x, n. That's fine. So mu zero, mu one in the setup that we have in the model, like in the prior that we're going to give, is going to be to remember zero and a hundred, right? When we write it in mathematical form. But then uh, for the mean, you can just give zero. That's fine. But then remember, d norm takes precision. So that's why the G0 and G1 that we used in the denorm uh, came out in JAX will have to be the precision. So that will be 1 over of the mean squared. Okay. Lastly, we're giving gamma 1, 1. So A and B, both of them are 1. So this part, again, sometimes you want it, sometimes you don't. Depends. This is always trying to like get reproduced for results. So you can like use this niche function and then you can create uh, the seed in this way. So again, JAX only takes set seed in this way, not by just set seed in R. It would, wouldn't take in that way. Okay. All righty, and lastly, you can run the JAX, and you use the run JAX function, and then for simplicity, we're doing one chain, pass the data. The monitor in this case, we are having three parameters, right? Theta, zero, beta, one, and sigma, so you can monitor all of them. We're doing 1,000 adapt, 5,000 burn in, and 5,000 sample. For, to start, you can always choose thinning to be one, and later you can check the autocorrelation, all that, to determine if you want to think a little bit more. And then the init is the init function that we just specified. All right. OK, so let's look at um, the first summary here. Plus zero summaries of all parameters. Um, yeah, let's spend a couple of minutes. You can talk with your neighbors um, about your understanding, I guess, especially about beta zero and beta one and their interpretations. Okay, so we talked about the interpretation of beta zero and beta one. And don't forget that yi is the log expenditure. Okay, everything is on the log scale. And then xi is the um, log income. So yeah, or anything else that you want to talk about, especially looking at the summary. Anything stands out from here? You notice that the effective sample size for beta 0 and beta 1 is really low. Mm -hmm. So we might want to run JAGS again and use spinning mm -hmm. and run mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I have a question actually like related to that. Mm -hmm. And also, it's like kind of on our homework, like with that last question, why do we, if we, let's say we are given uh, some summary statistics like this that imply that some parameters not like explore the parameter space very well with low effective samples, why do we have any reason to believe that like thinning or running the chain longer will allow it to <coughs> explore the parameter space at all? Right, like, yeah. So I don't, yeah, so good point. So I think thinning and running longer would at least, so again, effective sample size is a rule of thumb of 
checking that if you couldn't even get enough effective sample size, you can say that, well, we are not exploring it well enough. And uh, thinning and um, adding like longer chain will help you alleviate that issue. But to be honest, I think you can never be sure whether you have explored the parameter yeah. space well enough or not. Yeah, at least in the way that we are covering. So, I mean, um, Markov J. Monte Carlo itself is a whole big research area. People are like trying to develop newer um, sampling methods. I think one uh, project team is actually looking into that, uh, like as a, like a alternative to MCMC, all that. So, so it itself is being like, researched. Out. I'm I'm not an expert on that, so I can only say that well. If you um, know that the effective sample size is low, like typically we want to have at least 100 or like 500 if you can, but then 28 is low, especially concern. I mean, considering that we're running this for 5,000 iterations, right? You only get 28, and that also going to show up in this column, the AC10. So that's the left hand autocorrelation. Okay, so that means even after between 10 draws, you already have, you still have about like 0.9 autocorrelation among them. So that actually combined together with the plots that I'm prepared here. So this is the um, um, MCMC diagnostic plot that to go to do for in this case beta zero, pretty sticky as you can see. Okay, we want to see like like up and down much more often, and this is I think where the flag is that well it's really very highly correlated, and you can see that even after you lag 35, it's still high. So that can give us an indication of how big our thinning should be. Right? So that's for beta zero and then beta one as well sticky in the upper left and also very high autocorrelation on the bottom right. For sigma, I think overall it's fine. As you can see, I mean, on the, the summary output is fine and then this is uh, overall, the plots are fine as well. So the solution, I mean, it's just a quick solution here is I set thing to be 50 to get rid of the stickiness in beta zero and beta one. You might argue that 50 is not enough and we can actually evaluate it once we plot like all of those MCMC diagnostics as well as the summary. So I'm going to show you here uh, really quick as well. So this is the new, um, sorry, I named it posterior underscore new. So you can again look at um, effective sample size as well as, uh, well, in this case, yeah, I actually never noticed it. I guess, yes, they give you the 500 uh, lag autocorrelation, I guess, because we do like 50 times um, uh, longer in terms of the thingy. So uh, definitely better than before. And if you look at, um, right, so autocorrelation here, you might even want to do more. But this is just a demo, so you can do 50, but if you want to do more. The running time probably is not too bad for simple models like this. So feel free to run it even longer and then doing thinning a little bit more. So, um, so those will be an example of what we have. So um, I also want to cover the interpretation of the regression coefficients a little bit. We mostly care about beta zero and beta one. Okay, so sigma is capturing the standard deviation. It's less, I mean, it's, it's more challenging, I think, to interpret what that means. But we know that the intercept and um, the uh, slope, both of them are talking about the expected outcome. So the intercept, if you remember, uh, the expected value, I don't expect you to remember, but it's from the output that we just saw. The median is 4.3-ish, and then the 90% posterior interval is 3.93 to 4.75. So what you can say about this is, for a consumer unit with log income zero, that's income of one on the original scale, the expected outcome, which is the log expenditure, is by median about $4.3, okay? And then it falls into this 90% posterior, I mean, credible interval with 90% posterior probability. So that's, I mean, mimicking, I think, what people usually do in the frequentist approach as well, whenever you have the estimate about the point estimate as well as the confidence interval, credible interval, you can make interpretation like this, okay? And similarly, for the slope, Again, it's $1 increase, it's one unit increase, but then in this context, it's $1. So if you have um, every $1 increase in the log income of the CU, it's log expenditure gonna increase by 0.4, that's the median. And also this increase is falling into this interval with 90% posterior probability. And so this, again, I think some of you have seen this before, so not much very different. 
Um, but sometimes we do want to use the media instead of the mean to summarize in this case, just because the posterior distribution. Yeah, actually, let's take a look at it if it's very symmetric. It's a sigma. Yeah, so beta 1, beta 0 overall symmetric. So you can choose either. Uh, yeah, when I say symmetric, I'm looking at the histogram over here. So um, yeah, you can use the mean, use the medium, whichever you prefer. Okay, but just like note which one you're using. All right.